kind of get us started here. We had talked last time about what satisfies you. You might remember that. We went through different food combinations and how people talk about how, well, if you're hungry for this, you could be really satisfied with this. And we looked at where we get our satisfaction from. Now we're going to build a little bit on that. So looking at that satisfaction issue, imagine a spectrum. Imagine a line, if you will, with written on one end of that line, the word safe, and written on the other end of that line, the word satisfied, and ask yourself where you tend to place yourself within your life. Does your goal more towards safety, playing it safe, or is it more toward being satisfied? Because if you're going to really try to live a life satisfied, especially satisfied in Christ, is going to require risk. And we have a tendency within our society to really, really want safe over satisfaction. We really do. That is the American motto, is safety over satisfaction. And I know you might think that sounds weird, like an antithesis, because our world is so much about self-satisfaction and so much about that. But here's what's interesting. Really, the world plays it safe, and they call that satisfactory. They call that satisfying. They try to merge the two together and messes it all up. In fact, our world tries playing it so safe that there are actually the craziest warning labels on things. Have you noticed that? That there are the craziest nutty warning labels on things because they're so concerned that you might do something stupid that they want to play it so safe. They got to warn you about everything, everything. And so I just... Did a little brief research, nothing too extensive, because there's so many of them. Some of them I would love to share with you, but, you know, it just kind of pushes what's appropriate at the pulpit. So see me after church. <laughs> I'll be glad to share some of those with you. But like, here's some that are just fantastic. Like, for example, if you were to go down to Meyer and buy yourself some Nightall sleeping pills, okay? Nightall sleeping pills has upon the back of it a whole bunch of warning labels, one of which the warnings happens to be something that says, warning, may cause drowsiness. <laughs> I hope so, for their sake. <laughs> okay, they're, 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 uh, let's see. yeah, here we go, the Razor. Have you seen the Razor? It's a great little scooter, okay? On the back wheels of all the razors, either written underneath or on, if it's a double wheel, upon the middle of the wheel is a little sticker. And it's a warning sticker. You know what that warning sticker says? It says, warning. This product moves when used. <laughs> Again, I hope so. For their sake. <laughs> okay, one, one, one more, one more. There's... Uh, <laughs> this is the Dremel rotary tools, okay? Dremel rotary tools. And it has a whole bunch of warning labels on it, one of which happens to say, warning, intended or not intended to be used as a dental drill. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know about you, but usually when I buy a rotary tool or a drill or anything like that, my first thought is not to put it in my mouth. Okay, this shows that when we look at the diversion or the dividing between safe and satisfaction, it doesn't mean stupidity is in mind. Okay, so <laughs> being, this is too risky. This is too much of stupidity. I mean, our society is so much towards safety that we have to put on coffee cups, warning, hot. you seen that over at, at Meyer gas stations, at McDonald's. You can't even, playground equipment, for crying out loud. When I was a kid, the playground equipment was made out of metal, not Tupperware. Okay, <laughs> it was. It was made out of metal. So much so that when you went down the slide, you knew one of two things had to take place. One, you either wear long pants, or if it's in the middle of summer, because it gets scolding hot, you need to go down that slide super fast. <laughs> one of the two has to happen. It was an adventure. And my butt getting blistered today? I don't know. Gonna go find out. We're going on this ladder that looks like it's going up to the sky. And we're just gonna go up on this thing, sit on it, and go, oh boy, this is hot. This is hot. Here we go. <laughs> Woo! Skin left on the slide. That was a good ride. You know? <laughs> now what they got is these little Tupperware slides that I swear 
have like static charge wannabe builds. I get electrocuted going down. Somehow this is safer. And they made the ground, instead of being out of like just dirt or asphalt or gravel, they got this rubbery padded, I'm a pillow mattress type memory foam now that they put all over the ground so that if kids fall they don't get hurt no if they fall they play ping pong with the equipment boom 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 and they're bouncing around in fact so much safety has gone in toward the playground equipment that the new york times actually did a report uh, in 2011 this is three almost actually now four years ago depending on when in 2011 i think it was later in the year that the equipment is so safe now that it's actually stunting children development when they go to the park and this was a big long study about that and psychologists are getting concerned that we're making things too safe and of course then people started lashing out at the new york times and at the psychologists what you want to hurt our kids you want them to get injured you want them to get burned you want them to get and they're like you did and you're fine, <laughs> why not your kids? You know, and so it's just been this big battle, this big, big battle. So here's the thing, everybody today, they wanna play it safe. They say, don't be politically incorrect, don't rock the boat, don't insult, don't offend, don't try to, to jerk anyone around, don't try, and they say all these things to try to be safe. So much now that even pastors are starting to get nervous. What can I say? What can't I say? What if I could get arrested because I might offend someone? I might upset someone because we can't offend because then we're viewed as unloving. And, and the society has made it so much that they're told towards safety that satisfaction's getting lost. It's getting lost. And you start telling the society about that. Satisfaction's getting lost. You need to, you, we need to not be so safe about this. If you got the truth, you need to share the truth. And sometimes that truth is going to offend. And you know it's going to offend because the truth, well, if you don't got it, it's gonna tick you off. Jesus said that the truth will set you free, but it's gonna tick you off first. You know, that's what it's gonna do. That's what the truth does. Because if you don't have the truth, then that means you are ignorant and opposite the truth, AKA wrong. And so if someone's drowning and they say, I'm doing just fine, but I'm drowning, and you tell them you're drowning. Well, yo, you're offending me. Sorry, I'll keep the life ring to myself. You know, that's what the society's wanting. And that's not playing, that's playing it safe, but it's not, is that really satisfaction? Is that really satisfying? Okay, and so that's what's going on in our world. And now what we're looking at in the book of Acts is a group of the, of the early church. They have gathered. Pentecost is an annual festival that had been taking place for, for eons. And now at this one particular Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came in a very special way, very unique way. And the apostles were filled with the Spirit and doing amazing things. It was a phenomenal moment in the church's history. And they are going to come across this tension between safe and satisfaction in Christ. They're gonna come across this tension because here's what's happening. They're, they're preaching about Jesus resurrected and then the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Isonines and all these other religious leaders and political groups don't like it. So they're arresting them, throwing them in jail and then they get released and now they have to ask themselves, are we gonna play it safe or are we gonna have our goal be satisfied in Christ? And so what they do is they say, we want to be satisfied in Christ. We're going to keep going with the mission. So they go right back and they preach again. Then they get arrested again. Then they get released and they go right back to preaching. And they get arrested again and beaten and flogged. And they come out and they preach some more. You, you, society would look at that and say, what a bunch of thick skulled numbskulls. And we would go, heroes of faith. Because we're looking at it from a satisfied point of view, not a safe point of view. And that's going to be our challenge today. That's going to be our challenge for the rest of our walk with Christ is are we living a life with the goal of safety or the goal of being satisfied without being stupid? I need to add that phrase to it. We can't be jerks. Okay, you're supposed to love Jesus and love people. And that loving people also means that we're going to have to share the total truth. It means we can't play it with safety as our goal. Has to be something else. Has to be something else. 
So in Acts chapter 5, in verses 12 through 16, will actually serve for us a good background for what's going on. So we'll continue where we left off. We left off at verse 11 last week, starting at verse 12. So we're going to start at 12, where we left off, actually two weeks ago. And it's just going to help us get a good recap to get a good running start. We've got a lot of material for today. We're going to go all the way to you know, verse 18. I mean, we've got we yeah, so far to go today. And <laughs> next time we're going to go all the way to verse 42. So we got a lot of verses next time we gather together like this. So Matthew, or Matthew, Acts chapter 5. That was a regress flashback. So Acts chapter 5, verse 12 starts off and says, uh, Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. Okay, in other words, people were getting healed, demons were being driven out, people who were lame were walking, people who were sick were made well. It was a miraculous time, miraculous time. Paul later goes on to say that it's these wonders and miracles that proves that an apostle is an apostle, that proves that what's going on is the foundation of the church that needs to be laid. So they're acting very much like Jesus, even though he has ascended, they are now his hands and feet in the present of their ministry. So they are having the powers that he had. He has given it to them. So many signs and wonders were being done. By common consent, they would all meet in Solomon's colonnade. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people praised them highly. Let's pause here just for a brief second. None dared to join them. Why did people not want to dare be part of this special celebration and join them so fervently and with such gusto? Well, because of what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, Ananias and Sapphira, there was a point earlier in Acts chapter 4 toward the end where they had one heart, one mind. The Holy Spirit convicted everybody to bring, to sell their, some of their possessions, bring the money together, pool it together. You know, it's like a preemptive strike of the cooperative program. Okay, so just kind of pool it all together and then they're going to be able to use that money to make sure that nobody was without need. Okay, that, that they could just be able to help support each other because the church had no income. It's not like they had bake sales, not like they had stock and apple or anything like that. They just didn't have that. So the only way they're getting money is through tithing. They're still a semi-small group. I mean, they're, they went from 120 to like thousands of people, but it's not thousands of tithing people. So they're going to be struggling with their finances. So they said, you know, we all got lots of property. Let's sell some. Let's bring it together. And they all, the, of the early church, the apostles were in the lead Leaders were in agreement. We like this. Let's do this. And then Luke points out two examples, a positive example and a negative example. Positive example was a guy named Barnabas who sold his property and his real estate and gave the money to the apostles' feet and said, here you go. I lay it at your feet. Do with it as you see fit. No designation requirements. Then there was Ananias and Sapphira. They vowed to do the same thing, but they decided when they sold a piece of their property to keep some of the money for themselves. Tell the apostles, here's all the money for the property. We're keeping some. We're not telling you that. We're going to keep it because it's a lot of money, and we want to keep some of it. After all, you know, our furnace isn't working right, and we just lost a tire, so we really could use the money. So yeah, we sold the land. We vowed to give all of it to you, all the money. Here's all the money. He, 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 he. And then Peter, moved by the Spirit, said, why are you lying? You're lying to God. This is not just about money. It's not about the people. This is about God and your vow to God. And this is about how now we're trying to be unified by the Spirit. And you're letting Satan actually tickle your heart. Satan's involved in this. He said, Satan is putting these desires into your heart. And so then Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, were both struck dead right there on the spot. They just fell to the ground and struck dead. And that made everyone freak out. And I totally agree. I would be amongst the freaked out people, okay? If I was, if I was you know, looking at uh, joining a church, I'm finding out that if people break their vow and something doesn't go quite right, that they're being struck dead, I'm looking for a different church. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. That's why I'd be like, I'm not going to. Now, they're doing great things. Look at that big church. They're doing great things. Lots of people are getting saved. People are getting baptized. That's awesome. Look at that. They're helping the homeless. They're, they're helping single moms. That's awesome. You're going to join that church? No way. People are dying over there, man. No way. But I'm going to love them. I'm going to be glad for them. But I'm going to go to this other group over here. This seems safe. Okay, so see that desire between safe satisfaction? 
resurrection. Okay, it keeps playing out. And so that, that's what's going on with the people. They're, they're just kind of freaked out. They're not wanting to join them going to Solomon's colonnade and worshiping there because that's over at the temple. That's where they keep getting arrested and thrown in jail and beaten and released. And then the apostles keep going back to the temple and worshiping and praising. And they keep getting arrested and getting released. And the people are like, you know, not only are people dying in the church, but people are also getting beat, and they keep going back. You think they'd find a different neighborhood to witness to? You know, apparently that church has gone all that temple's gone all ghetto. It's gone East Grand. It's gone, you know, South Side Grand Rapids. It's gone, you know, it's like Cherry Street and Granville Avenue. You just don't go there, and so people are just getting beat. They're getting mugged. They're just. You know, and then they keep going back. What's up with them? I'm not going to join them over there. I'm going to go over to Alpine Street. At least it's safer. As long as I stay away from the bowling alleys, I'll be fine. Okay, and, and so it's, it's that type of mentality amongst the people. We're staying away. We're staying away. But we love them. They're doing great stuff. We're going to praise them. We're going to be thankful for them. Yeah, go preach, go preach, sucker. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. Okay, so that's what's going on now. That's the end of verse 13. Verse 14. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. This is awesome. People are still getting saved. The church is not really growing now. Okay, and people are being added, so the church universal is, being, is growing. But not the local church isn't really growing because people aren't wanting to join them by doing a lot of this ministry. So people are getting saved. They're doing ministry in their neighborhoods, their areas, but they're not being part of the apostles' group. And that can be frustrating for some people when they look at the ministries of a church and they say, why aren't we growing? Why aren't we growing? We must, uh, why even bother doing ministry because we're not growing like everyone else? And here's the thing. The goal is the kingdom of Christ, not the individual local church. So go and share the gospel with people and let them go wherever they go as long as they're going in Christ. That's awesome. That's the goal. That's the plan. Okay, so the apostles are being faithful. They're still preaching. They're still going. Even they're, and the whole universal church is increasing in numbers. Okay, crowds of both men and women, which is awesome. Okay, it's this rising of status of women. They keep being looked down upon, although in Roman society, women actually held high positions of power, like lawyers and mayors and governors at times and, and head philosophers. But within Jewish circles, they, they aren't looked upon very highly. And so it's neat to be able to see that throughout Scripture, God always wants to elevate the women up, always respects them. And here we see even more. It's men and women were coming to know Jesus and were, they were getting saved, being added to the Lord. As a result of what the apostles are doing, this is interesting. They would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Now, we need to talk about this for a moment because this is weird. Okay, this is really, really weird. I want you to notice something very, very interesting. One, or several things very interesting, not just one. But first... Luke does not say they were healed from Peter's shadow. Notice that. Luke recorded a very similar event back earlier in the Gospel of Luke where a woman was bleeding and she thought, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus, then I might be healed. And she got through the crowd, touched just Jesus' robe right on the hem, and she got made well. And Luke records that her constant cycle that was always bleeding, she was made well. And this was a miracle to her. She was so excited. Here, they're just hoping that Peter's shadow can come by them, but Luke does not record that they were made well from that. They were made well from the signs and wonders performed by the apostles, not by accidental bumping into them or being crossed on by their shadow. So why were they doing this then? Well, interesting thing, number two, people had a superstition back then that believed that your shadow is an extension of your personality. They had to believe that your shadow was part of you, therefore contained your personality, and therefore contained your power. In case you think that's absolutely stupid, watch Peter Pan. Okay? <laughs> Some of that still lingers, right? Because he's, Peter Pan's constantly chasing his shadow. Okay? It's viewed as a life independent of him. Isn't that interesting? Of course, Pan is actually part, uh, is actually was a false god that was part of the Greek-Roman period, 
Pan was his name. He was a mischievous little guy that would prank pranks, uh, play pranks on people. He was a false god. There was actually, a, at the top of Mount Horeb, there was a temple that was built to the sacrificing to the god of Pan. And if people thought that if they didn't sacrifice right, that Pan would actually strike upon them and, and destroy their life. So they became severely afraid, to which a word got created from that fear called panic. Okay, and so... This, that belief, Peter Pan, very much rooted into that. Of course, Peter Pan uh, plays a pan flute. The pan of the god of pan had a pan flute. And everything really much directly connects, including the superstition of the shadow. Because the people back then believed in pan and worshipped pan inappropriately because a false god. They worship pan. In fact, when Jesus talked to one woman, a, a, a Samaritan woman, and she says, you know, well, do you worship on this mountain or this mountain? Remember that? And Jesus said, well, the time will come when the, the God will require that people be worshiping in him in spirit and truth, and the time has come, right? Remember that part? Okay, when she says this mountain or this mountain, it's the mountain of Pan or the mountain where Jews were worshiping. Those were the two mountains, okay? So it's, it's interesting, that type of development. So here people are still stuck in that type of false religion going on. So it's interesting that they're still struggling with that, and they're still wondering, is Peter stronger than Pan? Okay, is Peter stronger than this false god Pan? Is his shadow more powerful than Pan's shadow? Okay, that's this idea that's kind of going on there. And that brings us to point number three. Like Jesus, whose fame went widespread, that people came from afar to just even touch his robe, so Peter's fame and the fame of the apostles is spreading so far that people are gathering just to even maybe be touched by his shadow. That's how popular the apostles are becoming. That's how much reputation they have. This is how much fame has been going out amongst the apostles. Okay, this, this is huge. People are coming from all over. The apostles are still doing ministry specifically in Jerusalem. They're specifically in Jerusalem still. So people are coming to them. Pretty soon the apostles are going to branch out and they're going to leave Jerusalem and go to the people. But that's not happening yet. They're staying localized. They're in, still in Jerusalem. And so people are gathering to the apostles, hoping that maybe they might just get a glimpse of them, that they might be changed forever. Verse 16, in addition, a large group came together from the town surrounding Jerusalem, bringing sick people to those who were tor and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Okay, and they were all healed, not because of Peter's shadow, but because of the Holy Spirit moving through the apostles and the signs and wonders that they were doing. And so they were all healed, not some, all, every single one that came. It's no wonder their popularity grew so extreme. I mean, how many of you have maybe have some type of uh, infirmity or disability or pain or something you would just love to be able to say, if I just go to someone and they look at me and they say, be well, that that would be gone. You guys got something like that? You know, I most certainly do. I got a knee that goes out of joint sometimes. I would love to get rid of my glasses. I would love just so many things that I would absolutely love. Okay, so it, 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 I know my wife loves my glasses. She'd say, fine, if you don't need glasses anymore, then take the lenses out and wear the frames because you're hot. And, <laughs> and I like it. My wife thinks I'm hot, so I, maybe I would still wear my glasses. Who knows? But nonetheless, okay, so all the people are kind of coming around. They're coming to the people, and all of them, all of them are getting healed. All of them are getting healed. Very, very, it's just, I, I point out all because it's so different than it is today because things have changed over time that now not all are getting healed today. Not all. Sometimes people are made well, and sometimes people are healed, and sometimes God uses doctors, and sometimes God miraculously intervenes, and weird things happen we can't explain. We just go, hey, if that's what happened, praise God. That's awesome, as long as it's for his glory and not about the person doing it, because I'm not typing my credit card to somebody on the TV who's asking me to touch the TV and be well. That's just stupid. I'm about satisfaction over safety, but I don't want stupidity. Okay? And so back and forth, we get to go on that. So here's what's happening. They're getting really popular, right? The apostle, you get the idea of the level of their fame? Who's not going to be appreciative of this? The people who had the fame in advance, who were the leaders before, 
Who were the rulers ahead of the apostles before they came on the scene? So what ends up happening is there's a rise of jealousy within the city of Jerusalem. Verse 17 and also verse 18 says, Then the high priest took action. He and his colleagues, those who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in the city jail. Now the apostles are in jail again. Again. And now we're going to see later is that the high priest and the Sadducees are going to be so fed up with them that they're going to eventually get to the point of wanting to kill them and have them executed. We're going to see the weird miraculousness that's going to happen later when Peter and the apostles get out of jail and then get put back in, and it's just, it's an amazing time. It's an amazing time. It's really weird because they get out of jail, and it's miraculous. The doors are still locked, and there's no windows, and the guard never saw anything happen, never fell asleep. It's just a miracle that happened, and when they get released, where did the apostles go? Right back to Solomon's colonnade, preaching about Jesus again, so when the Pharisees, or the Sadducees say, hey, bring us a prisoner, so we can't, they're, they're gone. Well, where are they? Well, they're over there preaching. Well, what? Well, go back in there and bring them back, and then they started beating them and say, we're going to kill you guys, and, and it's just, it, the, the level of jealousy accelerates to hostility, excessive hostility, to the point of even wanting to commit murder. This jealousy rising has taken place. Now, I want to talk about this for a moment because this is something that we can struggle with on everyday life. So I just kind of want to pause here and, and look at this. Look at this jealousy that's happening within the Sadducees so that we can kind of see how this might even rise up in us from time to time. And here's what I want you to notice. Jealousy always, always involves three. Okay, always involves three. It involves the person, whoever they may be. It involves who or whatever it is that they love. And it involves a rival. Okay, and it involves a rival. Is George Lucas jealous of J.J. Abrams from doing Star Wars Episode 7? You know, he would say publicly, no, I'm not jealous. I'm glad for him. More power to him. But then we're able to notice other little subtleties. Like, have you seen the new trailer yet, George? No, I don't care to see it. And then he saw it by accident by going to the theater, and it was a trailer before a movie. So then he's like, yeah, I saw the trailer. They used none of my original ideas. When I, he sold the company, he gave them a script for Star Wars 7 and 8 and 9, uh, an outline and whatnot. And he said, yeah, they didn't use anything that I had previously written. They're going a whole new direction. So I guess now I get to be a fan rather than the parent. Jealousy there? A little bit. Just a little bit. And I can understand that. This was his baby. He made it. He wrote it. He's in the 70s. This was the beginning of his career big time. He had a couple of small films beforehand, but this was his baby. He sold this to a studio, to Fox, by sitting Indian style on the floor playing with toy planes, saying, pretend these are TIE fighters. Pretend my fist is the, is the Death Star. And he's making sound effects, sitting like, I'm not kidding. Okay, this was his baby. He was passionate. And now someone else is doing it, and they have already higher success in the Star Wars universe than he is, ha- has ever had in his latest, newest trilogy. Already, even just the trailer has had more views of a trailer than the history of motion picture. Has more downloads than any trailer ever for any movie. This, it's just huge. Everyone's going, Abrams, Abrams. And then they're like, whatever happened to George? Who cares? Abrams, Abrams, and they're all excited. And then every now and then someone interviews George and he goes, I don't care. Okay, that's how that's what happens with jealousy. Okay, jealousy is something that we can all it, it has something, and then you begin to be afraid to lose it. And out of that fear of losing it, you want to hang on to it. And that emotion is jealousy. That emotion is jealousy. And sometimes that jealousy can be good. Sometimes that jealousy can be bad. Okay, so it always, always involves three. The person, person A, who or whatever it is they love, and a rival. 
person B or C, depending on what that love is. If it's a person, then they're person B, and the rival's person C. Okay, so always involves three of some sort or another. And here's what's interesting, is that jealousy has a tendency to provide self-fulfilling prophecies. In other words, jealousy can create that which it fears. Jealousy can actually create that which it fears. Take, for example, a woman who maybe is in high school or early college, and she's dating a guy, and she loves that guy, wants to hang on to that guy, but he has these classes where there's hotter women, smarter women, whatever, that are in the class, and they're flirting with him, and they're talking with him, and he's talking back, and she doesn't want to lose her boyfriend, and so she begins to get jealous. And so out of that jealousy comes behavior that might actually be destructive. I'm going to make sure I'm always next to him so he always sees me. I'm going to text him all the time so he's thinking of me when he's around other chicks. I'm going to be able to, I want to make sure that he gets a, 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 a bear, roses, flowers. I'm going to buy, I'm going to make sure he's right. I'm going to make sure that, oh, he hasn't texted me in an hour. Oh my word, what is he doing with someone else? I got to call him. He's not answering. I got to find him. And out of that obsessiveness, out of that obsession, out of that, that desire to control, to cling on to, she becomes hyper needy to the point that the guy goes, wow, this chick is mental. <laughs> and these chicas over here, they're smarter, hotter. I never thought of them before, but they are less maintenance required. I might just break up with this high mental girl and go with one of these chicas over here. Okay, and so therefore, and it was never the thought before but it was caused by the jealousy. Caused by the jealousy. Think now of the Sadducees. They were the ones that were in, contra- in charge, in control. They were the ones that were popular. They were the ones that did the sacrifices. They were the ones that were the high priests. They were the ones that had the political control and the lifestyle that they liked. Now, a couple of fishermen and tax, ex-tax collectors, you know, people who saw the light and repented from the IRS, and, and uh, they had all these people that have gathered together, and, and they are now usurping the Sadducees. Granted, they're not the high priest, but they're doing something that doesn't require the high priest. The high priest says, come to me for your sacrifices. And these people are saying, we don't need the sacrifices anymore. This Jesus sacrificed for us. We're done with the temple. We're done with that. The church is now everywhere rather than in one place. It's not about people. It's not about a place. Now it's about a person. It's not about a religion. Now it's about a relationship. And everything begins changing. And the Sadducees are now seeing their political control going away. They're seeing their faith going away. They're saying their lifestyle's going away, and they want to hang on to it. So their thought is, if we beat the apostles, if we are violent toward them, if we warn them, scare them, intimidate them, kill them, then we can keep our control. And what's going to happen with the people when that starts happening? They're going to hate the Sadducees. And that becomes what holds the Sadducees off sometimes. Someone comes up and says, you realize how popular these guys are? If you kill them, you're going to have a riot. And the Sadducees go, we don't care. We want our power back. We want our love and respect back. And they are beginning to cause that which they fear. That's what jealousy does. It plays a self-fulfilling prophecy. And like I said, mentioned before, there is appropriate jealousy. And then there is what I would call, rather than inappropriate jealousy, to help really identify what it's about, I want to call it idolatrous jealousy. Here's what appropriate jealousy is. God himself says he is a jealous God, right? And so God calls himself jealous. Therefore, jealousy is not a sin, because sin is that which is opposite God's holiness. So God calls himself a jealous God. And what that jealousy is, that's an appropriate jealousy. It is jealousy that says, you are to treat me and only me as God. That's what God says. Have no other gods before me. When a person is married, there is appropriate jealousy to say that their spouse will treat them and only them as their spouse. No affairs, no pornography, No, you know, lusting off everywhere else, but to treat your spouse and only your spouse as your spouse, right? That's, and for a spouse to want that, that's appropriate jealousy, very appropriate jealousy. 
It is very appropriate for my wife and I to be jealous for each other's affection. Very appropriate. That, that's that's God-like, right? That, that's reflecting God. God is to be treated only as God, and I should be by my wife treated as a spouse, and she should be treated by me, and, and I should treat her as a spouse, and only her as a spouse. That's that appropriate jealousy. Idolatrous jealousy is where that jealousy moves from that to wanting to hang on to an idol. That which you find your comfort, your support, your security, your meaning in life. And no, that's not supposed to be your spouse. Your spouse is not supposed to be your purpose in life. Your spouse is not supposed to be your big all in all in life. That is God, not your spouse. Your spouse is supposed to be your partner in your walk in Christ. They are a partner, not a project. Okay, so they're, they're a partner in that. And so idolatrous jealousy is where it wants to hang on to something that it's not supposed to hang on to. And usually that jealousy tends to be around the three P's, if you will. That's, that's how I try to memorize things. I like alliteration. Okay, so I like things beginning with the same letter. So it's professions, possessions, and popularity. Profession, possession, popularity. Profession, some people make an idol out of their job. This is where I get my meaning. This is where I get my significance. This makes me who I am and what I am, and I have security. I have significance in life because of my job. Jobs are good. You're supposed to have a job. You're supposed to maintain a job. You're supposed to advance in your job. Absolutely true. It's not supposed to be your God. That's not where you get your significance from. That's not what makes you you. Your identity is not your job. If you lose your job, you are still you. You just don't do that job. Okay, so profession, uh, possession. Some people get their identity, their support, their security, their meaning based upon what they own. They say, well, because I, I am so-and-so and I'm a collector or I live in this house. I have this dog. I have these things. This is what makes me. And you know that people have an idolatry problem with possessions when they feel sad and upset and they comfort themselves by going shopping. Or if they're having a good time, they want to celebrate. So they celebrate by going shopping. It's shopping, possessions becomes that emotional stabilizer. It's that reward, it's that punishment, it's that comfort, it's that significance, it's that security. Or it could be popularity, that I get my meaning, my significance by being recognized by others, by being noticed by others, that I feel like someone special, and I am someone special. If they notice me on the street and want to call out my name, or if they notice me in the store and want to call out my name, or if I'm able to get good reviews and people like me and they respect me or they fear me, some people find that meaning from being tough and big and strong, and so people fear me so I can get what I want and do what I want and be able to control and manipulate out of that fear, whatever the case may be, out of professions, possessions, and popularity. This tends to be what our idolatrous jealousy is wrapped up in. We make gods out of things and positions and statuses. So whom are you jealous of? What are you jealous of? That's a little thought to ask yourself. Whom is it that you are jealous? jealous of i mean you can easily begin to identify it who is someone you might have some bitterness toward who is someone that you might say well it's easy for them to be happy they've got oh sure e, have you ever said the phrase something like well easy for you to say you have oh sure you you're okay with that oh sure you can vote that way because you don't have this as a struggle oh sure with your income or with kids like what you've got or sure with whom you're married to that's fine oh sure with your education whatever but i don't have that so whoop de doo to you and do you ever have that type of bitterness then you know where your jealousy is becoming rooted in in education and job and something along those lines at a leadership conference you always can find the jealous pastors I just got through going to a leadership uh, conference uh, just this past week, and, and I, I unfortunately had to, to leave early because of car issues. Nonetheless, I got to still experience what I always get to experience, which is jealousy amongst pastors. It's fascinating to watch, and it's fascinating to feel it in myself. I have it. I know it's there. I'm not perfect at this. I, I know it's there. I have the same jealousy, and I know... What is rooted in? I know where my repentance needs to continually be laid at the altar of Christ about over and over again, and it's about the size and influence of a church. 
And I know when it happens. I can tell who has it. Because a pastor comes in and he says, you know, they say, so how are, how's ministry going for you? Just don't ask pastors that. I need to have a rule. Do not ask about ministry to a pastor at a leadership conference. It'll take the focus all off everything. Because then a the pastor, oh, it's doing great. We had 3,200 people last Sunday. And then the other pastors are going, man, oh, I just feel like a loser. We had 100. And then another pastor's going, man, I would love to even have 100. I got like 50. And I'm going, man, where am I at in this totem pole? We've been averaging 30. What the heck? You know, and then they start exaggerating. Oh, yeah, well, we got 320 on our roll books. Yeah, you got 50 in the seats, 320 in the roll books. Score! <laughs> you know, and they start exaggerating. And then the ones that don't exaggerate, the ones that aren't like that, and they seem all holy and pious, they decide to go to the hostility tactic. They start saying, well, that's great. Praise God to you. They walk away, and they start bad-mouthing them. I bet they water down the gospel. I bet they're all about show and creativity rather than content. I bet they just got themselves a couple of rich families. Sure, if we had rich families who were tithing, we'd be able to be like that too. And I bet, oh, that's because they got, oh, they, they are all about, you know, not talking about the truth. They got, they're all about entertainment. They're all about the music. That's what they are. People just show up for the music. If we had a band like that, we'd be busting at the seams too. And, and on and on the attacking goes, belittling what's happening at that other church. And just in case you think it's just a pastor problem, church members do it too. Sometimes the same arguments as the pastors. Sometimes the church jealousy looks a little bit different. Why'd you do that? We didn't vote on that. That didn't come before the business meeting. That didn't, we have it right here in the manual. I mean, constitution and bylaws. Might as well be a manual. It says right here, we're supposed to have had that a vote. You couldn't have done that. Where does it say that? I don't see it. Right here in the footnote in the appendix. <laughs> You know, and <laughs> people are like that in the church. They are, okay? And they get this jealousy that comes up. And they'll hear about how a church paid $200,000 for a new steeple. That actually happened a couple years ago over in the Jenison area. A church put up a new steeple on top of the building. It was a $200,000 steeple. And people hear about it, and they're going, why did they pay $200,000? That's ridiculous. It's just our building. You know what they should have done? They should have kept their old steeple and given the money to us. <laughs> <laughs> jealousy jealousy it's there we're it's surprising how many times we might actually not be all that different from the sadducees we wish we would be different we like to think we are different until we get honest and we look at the motivations that are going on with inside of us, and we see that it is really twisted. And by the way, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 indicates that God judges and knows the motives of every person. He doesn't just judge the behavior, he judges even the motives. Why did I pick something out of 1 Samuel instead of the New Testament? Because there's lots of verses in the New Testament, and people think it's something that's new. It wasn't part of the Old Testament, and it was. So I like pointing it out from time to time. That God judges the motivations of the people that are there, which brings us to our fourth principle. When jealousy is affecting your life and jealousy is on the rise within your life, emotional thoughts are untrustworthy. You just need to be aware of this. Emotional thoughts are untrustworthy. Many of us come up to worship and we gather here to worship and some of us have jealousy within our hearts. And we might lie to ourselves and say we don't, but many of us do. All you have to do is have the phrase, I wish, and tell me how it would end. I wish I was married. I wish I was single. I wish I had kids. I wish I didn't. I wish I had that job. I wish I had that type of employment. I wish I had that type of car. I wish, I wish. Okay? I wish that I could walk by a chocolate store and breathe in the smell without it going straight to my hips. <laughs> I wish. You know, I go up to my, I, I sometimes go to my, uh, when I'm sick, I go to the doctor's office and they weigh me and they look at how much I weigh and they go, you're almost 40 and you weigh that? I'm like, yeah, I just, they're like, what's your exercise? I, it's just my lifestyle, I guess. I don't know, I don't purposely exercise. I just eat whatever and this is how I'm at. And they go, wow, that's nice for you. You <laughs> suck, but that's nice for you. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> jealousy. Okay, many of us gather with that type of jealousy within us. 
and we're here. And sometimes maybe even that jealousy goes the opposite direction for you. Maybe it goes to depression. Why should I give? I can't give as much as so-and-so. What difference will my tithe make? So-and-so can give $10 or $20 or $100 a week, but I, I can only give one or five. And what difference is that going to make? I can't tithe like them, so I might as well not tithe. Why should I work so hard at work? What difference is it going to make? I'm not going to get promoted like so-and-so because I don't have their education. I don't have their experience. I don't have the connections like they have. Why should I work like that? I'm just going to do whatever and just do the bare minimum and get out of here and get home. What difference does it make if I try serving God? I can't do it as good as the people up over here, and I can't speak as clearly as them over there, and I don't have the experience or the understanding, so why should I even try? And then depression comes in that's actually jealousy-induced depression. Why does it matter? What difference does it make? Why should I even do anything? And then it becomes a pity party. And the jealousy strikes inward. So I would like to share with you real quick, on closing, four battle arenas that take place within our lives, daily, daily lives, Okay, four battle arenas. Not all four take place all at the same time, but all four are taking place, uh, each one of these are four are taking place at some point or another. Four battle arenas where jealousy is going to rise up in your life and move you, tempt you to try to play safe rather than satisfied. And if you aim towards satisfaction, it's not going to be satisfied in Christ, it's going to be satisfied in your idol. Okay, that's what it's going, that's what these four battle arenas are about. And the first battle arena is when you don't get what you want. You don't get what you want. You wanted a pay raise, didn't get it. You wanted a job and you didn't get hired. You wanted to go on a date and they said no. You wanted to get a present from someone, they gave you a present, but it wasn't what you wanted. When you don't get what you want. When you have kids and they aren't exactly the kids you thought you were going to have. Okay, that when you don't get what you want. You go to a meeting and it was nothing like you expected. You don't get what you want. And when that happens to you, how do you respond? How do you respond? Do you go home and sulk and complain and cry? Lay in your bed with your back to the door wanting just to sleep because at least sleep you don't have to think about it and you just get all wanting to just get all depressed and lazy about it and just want to, I just want to sleep. I just want to do whatever and just put my back to the wall. Meanwhile, God is acting to you like he is to Elijah, kicking you saying, get up, get up, eat and get up. And Elijah was like, oh, woe is me. He went to sleep again. The angel had to come back, kick him again, wake up, get up, there's work to do. Oh, woe is me. Okay, and that's what God might be doing with you, but you're just laying in bed, laying on the sofa, got your little gown on. Okay, how do you respond when you don't get what you want? The second one is whenever you have to make a choice at a fork in the road. Whenever it comes that you can choose left or right, but you can't do both. Yes or no, but there's no, yeah, sort of. There's just nothing in the middle. You can't do both. You got to pick between the fork and the road. And at this point in time can come up jealousy and tempt you to play it safe rather than satisfied in Christ or be satisfied in your idol rather than satisfied in Jesus. And what this ends up doing ends up saying that that jealousy moves you to want to uh, sacrifice, sacrifice and compromise the gospel to sacrifice value so you can get something easier, to compromise the gospel so you can get something faster. This is where people will say that, you know, I really want someone in my life. I really wish I was married like so-and-so, and I don't even have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, and I just, I'm all jealous about that. I wish I had someone. Here's someone. Uh, they don't have a job, and they don't love Jesus, but at least they like me, and that's good enough. Because they like me, at least I can feel significant and whole and worthwhile again if I had this someone in my life. And everything in Scripture says that's a bad idea. That is not what God wants in your life. But they say, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to compromise because I want this person. And they're at that fork in the road. Yes or no to this person. Some people, they say that, you know, I don't want to wait for sex. I don't want to wait for, I'm going to have sex before marriage and outside of marriage because I don't want to wait. I, it's just so long. I know what scripture says and what God expects, but you know what? I'm just so, everybody else gets to sleep around. Why? And it doesn't seem to hurt them at all. So why does it matter with me? 
and they try to get things faster or easier. Some people will even drop out of school because it's easier. Some people will try to cheat on an exam because it's easier. Some people will try to cut all these corners rather than doing the hard work that God expects. The third one is dealing with difficult people. When difficult people come in, you can get jealous of those who don't have difficult people in their life. Those people don't exist, but we like to think they do. There are difficult people we have to deal with. And the question is, when you get those difficult people and they do not treat you with dignity and tact, they do not treat you with respect and integrity, how do you respond back? Are you jealous for the loss of any potential reputation or fame or popularity or significance that you lash out to try to take away theirs like a Sadducee would toward the apostles? Do you try to insult them back? Oh yeah, you said that about me. Well, guess what about you? You're not perfect. And people in the congregation do this to pastors all the time. Pastors will say, hey, the Bible says this is a sin. They go, oh yeah, like you're perfect. Never said I was. That's not the point. Still a sin. There still needs to be change. But people like to lash out. They like to lash out. And the last one, and this one's going to probably sting the most. When things do not go according to your plan, when things do not go your way, there comes a temptation to want to play things safe or to be jealous and lean toward your idolatrous idol rather than satisfied in Christ. When things do not go, your, especially when you start getting four and one combined together, Things don't go your way and you're not getting what you want and all that's happening at once. And what we comes is the temptation to play things safe rather than being thankful with what God has provided for you, rather than uh, treasuring what you've been given, accepting what has taken place and moving forward anyway. That, by the way, is not playing it safe. It's playing it satisfied in Christ. To say that this is what I've been given. It's not what I wanted. This is what has happened. It's not what I planned for. It's not what I expected. And I'm definitely not completely pleased about it. Yet I'm going to accept that this is what is taking place. I'm going to accept that God is good. And that God is in control. And that one day Jesus will return. And one day he will set the record straight. And one day he will bring in and usher in his kingdom in full and I won't have to deal with this anymore. Until that day comes, I'm going to move forward with this in play as is and honor God along the way. That's not playing it safe. That's playing it satisfied in Christ. And if you're going to do this, if you're going to make it through these four things, being satisfied in Christ, not in your idolatrous idol, not in your idolatrous jealousy, not in playing it safe. Instead, by the way, if you're playing it safe, your, your comfort is your idol. Because then your goal is being comfortable. Your goal is a life without pain and suffering. And I know we don't want to have a, a person that sounds weird. They say, what's your goal in life? I want pain and suffering. Yeah, there's places for people like you. You know, I know we don't like that. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life, more abundant. Life more abundant, not good things more abundant, but life more abundant. It's going to be a hard life. And he had it right. It's a hard knock life, right? Jesus said, you're going to find tribulations. You are going to find suffering. People are going to hate you because of me. You are going to find it difficult. You need to take up your cross. That means you got to sacrifice everything about you and follow him. He said, it's going to be a hard life. And I came to bring life more abundant. So it's going to come. And if we're going to do it, if we're going to play it safe, if we're, not, if we're going to play it satisfied in Christ rather than playing it safe, what it's going to look like is that means we got to fear God rather than fearing people. Why did the apostles continually go back to the places where they were getting beaten and arrested? Because they feared letting God down more than offending people, more than getting beat by people, more than being rejected by people. They feared God's rejection more. They feared God rather than people. They loved God first, people second, and loved people enough to be able to share with them the whole truth without being jerks. 
So they loved God first. I like telling people when they want to get into dating, find someone who loves Jesus more than you. If they don't love Jesus more than you, break up. Don't date, end it right then and there. Tell them they can come back when they mature. And if they come back a week later, they're lying. Okay, so you love God first more than people, but then you also love people, point number three with that. You love people and you love them enough that you engage them with the gospel, the whole truth. That's what it's gonna take. That's exactly what it's gonna take. And that is going to require that we live a life based on God's standards rather than our own. It's gonna require that. It's gonna require that we look at scripture and that we let it change us. We look at his expectations and we let it change us so that we have a new heart, so that we have new goals, new plans, new desires, all the way down to the core of our being. We have that. We will find ourselves with faithfulness like the apostles. We have that. We will find ourselves with the boldness of the apostles. If we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, used by the Holy Spirit, and he's going to make us bold, we got to make that step first. We make the step, and the Holy Spirit will help us through. So where's the jealousy in your life? Where are you struggling with that? What do you need to say, God, I still put my value, my worth, my significance in the size of the church, in how much my salary is, in what my house is, in what I own, in what I drive, in how people view me, in, and I need, I need a change heart. I need my heart to change. I need to change right down to the core of my being. I need to be made new. I need to be a different tree. A tree all the way down to the roots that's been changed so that I can grow fruit for God's kingdom. But you gotta start with, where are your jealousies? Where is that idolatrous jealousy eating away at you? Bringing about hostility and bitterness, resentment, discontentment. You need to change. Change. 